Hi there. I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back to more Conversations. With us is the Tony Award-winning theatrical director, Bartlett Shear. Bart has won plaudits everywhere for his versatile and innovative staging of dramas, musical, and even grand operas. Bart Shear is the resident director of Lincoln Center Theater. And with two smash hit shows on the boards, My Fair Lady and To Kill a Mockingbird, he is, to paraphrase Mel Brooks, the king of old Broadway. Bart Shear's stagecraft is nothing short of magical, whether reviving musicals, deeply seated in the American canon, or giving new meaning to stories that were supposed to have been well understood. Bart Shear engages our intellect and emotions with not just the technical wizardry of his staging, but the contemporary resonance of the rich themes he portrays. In his rave review of To Kill a Mockingbird, Jesse Green of the New York Times said, Bart Shear has made sure that every movement, every perfectly cast face, every stage picture and costume tells the story so precisely that it would do so even without words. Bart Shear, we're delighted to welcome you to this table. Thank you. It's good now, to be here. You're a theatrical director. What does a theatrical director do? <laughs> right. Um, uh, well, let me start by saying there, there's a distinction uh, between an interpretive artist and a creative artist. I would submit that a director is an interpretive artist. So for us to do our work, unlike a composer or a painter, um, a little closer to a conductor. So for us to do our work, we need a pre-existing reality in the form of a text or a score. So essentially, you're given a text uh, like To Kill a Mockingbird, like My Fair Lady, like Otello the Opera, and you are, your job is to interpret that text, cast it, put together all the pieces, and give it a life, so you know some sort of action over time in front of people, and integrate all those elements, sets, lights, all that, into a unified experience for an audience. So it's uh, I always think the job of the creative artist is much harder than the interpretive artist because I get to work with you know Shakespeare or Chekhov or Adam Gettle or uh, whoever Lynn Nottage whoever it might be and the the texts that I get to work on make me often look pretty good. Uh, now, uh, is it necessary for a director to be an actor? Um, no. Um, Did you ever act? I have acted. Um, I've acted. I've done many of the. The, the different things that are required for me to do, I've done in some form or another. So when I first started directing, uh, no one could do the lights, so I taught myself how to do all the lights and ran the board as well as did the show. So there's elements like that, the sound, the choreography, the whatever. You sort of have to have a hand in all of it. You don't have to be able to be uh, proficient at it. Or you have to be proficient at it, you don't have to be great at it. Uh, now, um, in To Kill a Mockingbird, Atticus Finch says, to understand a man, you have to stand in his shoes or live in his skin. Yeah. Uh, don't you have to be an actor to be a director? How do you do it without being an actor? I mean, it's a good question. Uh, I think the, the, the skill and genius of actors is very, very special. And what I get to do is work with actors um, who have this extraordinary ability to manifest all these qualities and guide them and help them to deepen that work. But being good at that process, the guiding and the helping, is different than being good at the actual uh, craft of acting. Um, I'm much more of a, a guide. I try to put them in the right place, in the right position, build the story up so that what they're doing is revealed more intensely and more deeply than it would be in a production where even just being in the wrong part of the space, the wrong part of the stage for when an important moment happens can have an impact on the moment itself. And so a director can make a big difference in a performance. Do you cast the shows yourself? Yeah. Uh, I don't cast operas myself. Those are usually, those are always cast by opera companies, but all other shows, yes. Yeah. The other shows you cast. Yeah. Now, uh, approximately how much time does it take to mount a show on Broadway from beginning to end? Let's take uh, 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 To Kill a Mockingbird as an example. Uh, well, that's been about three years, I would say, from first, first uh, reading of the script to a couple of workshops to pre-production planning to casting. Um, uh, and that's a pretty standard amount. The casting process can take an extremely long time. In the case of South Pacific, I think I was casting it for almost a year and a half to get all the parts right. Uh, sometimes it's quicker, sometimes it depends. It's sort of an ongoing thing. I try to think of them as like living things, you know, where you're 
you're guiding them, and uh, they're changing all the time. And if you, if you put them into a single process, like it's going to take this long from here to here, I think it doesn't work that way. They, you're always making adjustments and changes and shifting the time schedule and building a process for their arrival. Now, you've been quoted as saying that To Kill a Mockingbird is one of the toughest uh, plays you ever had to direct. Yeah. Uh, what did you mean by that? Um, Why was it so tough? Uh, I think um, anytime uh, you take a story which uh, is so deep in the consciousness of the audience, in which the expectations in the audience are so profound, um, it's, it's both a blessing and it's its own challenge that the audience comes in as well prepared as they ever do for the show, because almost all of them will have read it, uh, will have seen the movie, will know something about To Kill a Mockingbird. And that, um, that pre-existing idea that they have some, some knowledge of it creates an expectation of what they're going to experience. So, uh, and I think a lot of the burden of this goes to Aaron Sorkin or, you know, or Scott Rudin, our producer, to create an experience which satisfies and evokes all of the themes and ideas in the story but makes that a theatrical experience. Now, Aaron Sorkin was the playwright. Yeah. And he adapted the play from yeah. the novel by uh, Harper Lee. Correct. Uh, and uh, he was not the uh, the screenwriter for the movie version with... Uh, no, that was Gregory, Horton Foote. That was Horton Foote. Horton Foote, yeah. Uh, and Gregory Peck won an Oscar for it. Correct. So did Horton Foote. Yeah. But uh, the, how did you come to uh, be associated in this project with Aaron Sorkin? Uh, well, really, this, the project was initiated by Scott Rudin, our producer, and brought all of us together. Um, and uh, it's just something I'd wanted to do for a long time, and Scott had been interested in doing it even longer than I had. So uh, we all kind of came together. Now, uh, Harper Lee died in uh, 2016. Yeah. Uh, did, um, and you said you were three years roughly in, uh, in rehearsal. Yeah. So did uh, she uh, commission Sorkin to write the, uh, the No, no, play? no, 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 no. That's all through Scott. I, I mean, he, he got the rights to do an adaptation, and um, uh, and she like, knew about uh, Sorkin and thought that was okay, and away we went. And he was, uh, he was basically known as a screenwriter rather than a playwright, isn't that... So. I mean, I suppose. I mean, I, I, he, he, Aaron started as a playwright. Yeah. He's, a, he's a wonderful playwright. Now, just uh, briefly, tell us something about uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. It was an autobiographical novel. It was really the only novel that, that Lee wrote. Uh, there was a draft of it, uh, Go Set a Watchman. Uh, but uh, she uh, it was really her, her basic uh, oeuvre, so to speak. Yeah. And, uh, well, just she, tell us something about the storyline. She, she was a, story uh, she's an extraordinary young woman, I think, when she wrote the book. She... Um, I think started, uh, Ghost Out of Watchmen had been written before she wrote um, Mockingbird, and I think she shifted her focus from what she was exploring in Ghost Out of Watchmen to Mockingbird and the stories of her youth, and began with these stories of these three kids, and then built that up into the story of Tom Robinson and her dad. And um, I don't know, it's just an extraordinary Rorschach test uh, this this novel somehow it's something all of us have to kind of come to grips with because it deals with these sort of central issues that sort of course through American life, issues of race, region, class, and also it's a beautiful story of and moral about, education and justice. Yeah, it, it's it's about moral education. How do kids learn? How do they learn about the idea of justice? How do they experience it? What you would call uh, I guess the uh, Bildungsroman was the f sort of famous word for it, you know, a loss of innocence. The a coming of age. Yeah, coming of age story of, of young Scout and her brother and Dill as they kind of learn the more hard, difficult lessons of, of, um, of their community and the life they're living and their so parents. So, To Kill a Mockingbird, the title really refers to the destruction of innocence. Perhaps. So I'd else. leave that up to the people who interpret novels like that. I mean, it's a wonderful metaphor, sure. Uh, but I do think it's it's about losing something, yeah. Losing something. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, there uh, are a number of things that happen uh, in the play. Uh, in, the, in the book, uh, the trial scene doesn't come until about halfway through the book. And right. even in the movie, it doesn't come along yeah. for a while. But you uh, basically start with the trial scene and then flash back and then flash forward. Yeah, I mean, I think the purposes, Aaron felt the purposes of theater were such that you had to be able to um, 
make it a theatrical event. If we were only wandering through the sort of world of the innocence of the kids before we got to the trial, it might have a little bit less theatrical um, uh, sort of teeth. And so he, he front loaded the trial and then moved, moved from there and we went back and forth. It's, it's very good for me theatrically because it allows us to have a context for where the story is heading and allows the audience, and it's especially helpful that the audience already knows the story. And if they didn't know it at all, then it would be a different thing. Something inherently dramatic about a trial. Yeah, yeah, and I also think anybody who reads the book is always surprised, if you haven't read it in a long time, that you don't remember how much, it spent, how much time it spends with the kids before it gets to the trial, because we all have such a deep memory of the trial. Now, the purpose of a trial is to administer justice. Yeah. You know, Harper Lee did study law. Her father was a she lawyer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, here, justice is denied. It's not uh, at least through the justice system. Correct. And then eventually, justice is delivered by a man who is in hiding and who the only evidence of his being uh, is uh, hidden in the nook of a tree. Yes, correct. I mean, is that a metaphor for uh, justice being elusive and... Uh, I, of course, again, I'm not a writer or interpreter on that level. I do find it, um, it's always satisfying in working on the story uh, to watch us sort of be pulled through different forms of justice. You know, the justice that, uh, whether it's administered, it's not administered in the trial and then how it surfaces or what, I think the, be the bigger question is, um, do we have an inclination toward justice or goodness? And so in a character like Boo Radley, you see somebody do something which he thinks is right from a very raw and pure place. Uh, another uh, major difference that uh, critics have commented on is that uh, in the book, uh, well, Harper Lee was 10 years old when her father was involved uh, with a, a trial that was somewhat similar. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in the uh, uh, book, uh, and it really, uh, the uh, uh, scout is uh, perhaps six years old. Yeah, eight years yes, old. Yes, eight years old yeah. as time goes on. But yeah. uh, in the uh, play, you have a, you see her as a teenager. Well, right. What's the reason for that shift? Um, well, there's a couple of things. One is um, when we first re uh, did a reading of the first version of the script, uh, we just decided to use adults. Um, to sort of test it and see what it was. It wasn't a point at which we were prepared to ask any of those questions. And I think um, Aaron certainly found that uh, the, the voice of the adults was just as resonant uh, as kids as they were as adults. I think there's a literary question, which is um, the, the narrator of the book is Scout at eight years old, but it's also Harper Lee at a much older age. So the shift in voice goes back and forth between a kind of innocence and an extremely sophisticated voice. So what's beautiful about Celia Keenan Bolger, who plays Scout, is that she's so extraordinary in capturing both the voice of a child, of an eight-year-old, and the maturity and depth of somebody much older looking back. And what we don't do in the course of the, of the play is um, try to explain the difference between the two. We just let them go, just let them do them. So they might be a kid, they might be an adult, they might, and they just shift back and forth. I think that's much easier to accomplish with older actors than it is to accomplish with a, with a child actor. The name Atticus Finch, you almost immediately associate it with uh, Gregory Peck. Now maybe future generations will associate it with Jeff Daniels, but yeah. is there a particular problem for a director where, and for an actor where the character has been so superbly played by an iconic star yeah. in another venue. I mean, I haven't really watched the movie much because I would sort of stay away from that. I mean, it, again, it's my job, it would be Jeff's job, as he said, you know, we had to put all that behind us, focus directly on the text in front of us and make the Atticus Finch for 2018, 2019. So we only were concentrated on um, our text, our approach, and making Atticus for today. I think that's the beautiful thing about um, the work that we do is that you can take a novel like that and it can have many iterations, all of them resonant for the time in which they happen. So the book being written in the late 50s and early 60s, the film which had a huge impact on many generations and particularly at the time it was made and now for us in 2018 and 19 to return to it, we get to ask questions as artists now about the story that we're 
we're asking for our current generation and return to it. And I think that's the activity of artists. That's what we do. We, we bring ourselves to our great stories, our great myths, and we return to them. Uh, the uh, interesting uh, focus of your career has been that it, uh, you seem to get involved with plays that have a contemporary resonance with yeah. major political movements and social movements and even economic movements of yeah. our time. Uh, and uh, in the book, uh, Tom Robinson is uh, shot in the back 17 times. Yeah. And then she wrote that in 1960. It resonates today with Black Lives Matter, of course. Yeah. Uh, in the movie, uh, the deputy accidentally wounds him and he dies of his wounds, right. uh, almost as if they sugarcoated it. Yes. And then you go back to his being shot in the back 17 no, times. No, ours is five, five times. Five times, okay. Yes. So yes. Uh, now how, did you, how did you arrive at that formula? Uh, I didn't arrive at it. Aaron arrived at it. But again, it's part of the same question of like asking what the, how these things resonate for us. Um, and I think anytime you do one of these stories, you're going to be running into details like that, which, which we have to ask ourselves each time, that, um, what the story means. In the same way as if I do South Pacific, it might have been that they were dealing with questions of race in 1949 and that it was a time when they were putting the first platform on race at the Democratic Convention. But when we return to it 60 years later, we learn different things about the, the question of race and segregation in the military and the idea of um, who get to be in our who gets to be in our families, and we were in the middle of, you know, asking questions of, uh, of all kinds about who was on our families, who got to be in our families when it came to gay marriage and things like that. So, that question that was asked in 1949 had a completely different resonance in 2008 when we were talking about gay marriage. So, they come around in different ways. My job is always the same. What is the immediate significance of the story I'm telling in the time I'm telling it? Okay, Why so, must it be told? So let's move on to My Fair Lady, which yes. is a, another story about who yeah. gets to be in your family. Yes, exactly. Uh, and uh, My Fair Lady, of course, was based on uh, Shaw's Pygmalion, which in turn was based on uh, a Greek myth of a sculptor who falls in love with a statue. Correct. Uh, and, and also based on Shakespeare's... Taming of the Shrew. Taming of the Shrew, that's correct. It's also based on Taming of the Shrew. So he had a couple of influences at the same time. Yes. Now, uh, you've been... Uh, uh, I think fortunate uh, in My Fair Lady that you've worked with uh, some very talented actors. In yeah. fact, uh, uh, two sets of actors in three major roles. Yes, I know. Yeah. Uh, is it a challenge for a director uh, once you've got the thing down with a, a really good actor and then somebody else steps in? Um, again, because you have Laura Bonatti who stepped in. Uh, yeah, no, again, uh, these, are living, Ambrose and, these are living things. And I'm in, I'm in a... Um, conversation with an artist. So I'm in a conversation with Lauren Am Ambrose, who's a particular kind of artist, and we build the piece with her. Laura Benanti comes in, who's a different kind of artist, and I build the piece with her. So we go back to asking the same questions. I can't make Laura Benanti do Lauren Ambrose's version. I have to allow uh, in my conversation for Laura to do her version. So it's it's just asking the questions over again with new artists in the same way Danny Burstein or, or Norbert Butts. It, it, it doesn't matter. They both have different approaches to it. They're both extraordinary artists and different things get emphasized. The story itself follows essentially the same shape that I built it physically. Um, but even that, we make changes. Well, you had a similar problem there to the one in Mockingbird because you have the uh, iconic role of Eliza, originally played by Julie Andrews, and yeah. the movie by Audrey Hepburn. Yeah. You have Rex Harrison uh, yeah. staring no, that, straight think, in the face. Uh, yes, I think, that, I think the influence of Rex Harrison over um, My Fair Lady was enormously huge for Harry Haddon Payton, who then went to do it. So I made a lot of changes in how to interpret the part. Uh, based a little bit more on the play, so Harry's much younger than uh, Harrison was. The part had kind of grown into a piece about an older man and a younger woman, and I thought it would be better if they were closer in age, um, and approached the part completely differently. But again, you're not only having a conversation with the text in front of you, you're having a conversation with your own theatrical history, and that's a, that's a fun conversation. Now, uh, the play, although the, the musical values are absolutely sublime, but the, the play is about a contemporary subject, the, the role yeah. of women, the yes. subjugation of women. Yes. 
And also the, the question of class, how Correct. the way one speaks often betrays uh, their origins, yeah. Uh, yeah. either ethnic or uh, economic or whatever. Uh, so how did you deal with uh, those issues? I know you love to deal with it. Well, no, that, I mean, there, uh, first of all, you have a very great, I mean, I, I have enormous support from Shaw, who wrote an extraordinary piece of writing, a revolutionary piece of writing in 1911, in which he took these questions of class and gender and put them into a piece and into the character of Eliza Doolittle. So it was a hugely revolutionary piece then, especially the, the question of language and, and your sound was would define your position in society no matter who you were. So when you get to reign in Spain and she actually says the words correctly, it's completely a paradigm shift in the culture that you can you know, pass somebody into the higher levels of society had a larger argument about the equality than any others. He had a difficult problem with how to end it. And the problem of ending it was that he was deeply against the romantic comedy notions that somehow they would have to end up together. He was, he wanted to end, he did not want that to happen no matter what. So he would not let uh, Eliza Doolittle and Henry Higgins end up together and didn't. When you got to the musical, they were more ambiguous about that. Hollywood. Yes. Happy ending, nice and tidy. Ambiguous, yes. <laughs> um, when we got to it, I, I looked at it differently. And one of the things that we discovered in going back to the research was one of the, the reasons Shaw was having so much trouble was there was very few option, real options for women if they did go out on their own. It was hard to get loans. It was hard to get money. It was hard to set up your own business. These were, that's how difficult the circumstances were. Now, when I look at the ending I, and she heads up the aisle, I think of her as going off into the future to a different kind of Eliza, Elizas that follow her. I have two daughters and want them to have models and stories of equality and opportunity that are absolutely the equal of men. Not fetching a man's slipper. Correct. So we were able to, to respond to those issues, which I think were already embedded in Shaw's text. And he does the same thing with the character of Doolittle, who is this very much a rebellious, anti-class figure who doesn't want to follow middle-class morality and all that. And they're brilliant, brilliant characters. Yes. Um, well, you, uh, in theater, go back to uh, the ancient Greeks yeah. so much. Yeah. And in the Greek myth, uh, Pygmalion, the sculptor, uh, falls in love with the statue Galatea and, and ends up uh, praised to Aphrodite and uh, the, yeah. sculpt, the, the sculpture comes to life and he marries her. Yes. So what's wrong with that? It's a myth. <laughs> That's <laughs> what's wrong with it. And I think Shaw identified that as a myth. He didn't really expect that. To, he was never going to end the story that way. And he borrows from the Pygmalion thing in the sense of uh, education and development. It, I think yeah, it's a myth. Of course, uh, an actor, famous actor, who uh, played uh, uh, Henry Higgins in The Pygmalion uh, thought it ought to end with a marriage. Yes. Uh, Shaw originally thought that it ought to end with a marriage, too, that uh, uh, she marries Freddie Einsford Hill. He wrote about that that was a possibility, but, uh, you know, he didn't create a character that even, even then was much of an option for her and then sort of changed his mind about that. So, so it was uh, the end and, and, and all of uh, and being of a woman to a matrimony? No, absolutely not. That's exactly what we're absolutely not saying. You're not saying Absolutely that. not. Absolutely not under any so, condition. So it, it has to be uh, something else. Now, of course, when the actor wanted a marriage at the end between Eliza and Henry, uh, Shaw said that would be an abomination. Abomination. And he was totally against that. And it's about agency, it's about uh, control over your own choices, it's about, you know, it's all of those things which, which and it's about equality, you know, that you have the same opportunities, the same, and that's why the, the figure of Mrs. Higgins is so interesting in the piece. Because well, here you've had two actresses too. Yes, two, yeah, two pretty amazing actresses. Diana yeah. Rigg and, uh, and Rosemary and Harris. And Rosemary yes. Harris. They're both extraordinary, and they were both very different from each other. Um, but Mrs. Higgins as a character, sort of the way she's raised her son, the way she sort of supports Eliza in her, in her development. I know both, uh, I know uh, Laura Benanti relies heavily on Rosemary Harris to kind of help her through to the end of the story. So it's, it's, it's a very, uh, I think it's a very, it's the beginning of a story with Shaw and we're still asking the question now, but we have a responsibility now not to, to, to really end it or allow it to be open to an ending, which we see today in our, in our world, not 
necessarily put it in the context of 1911 as if that's okay. Shaw wouldn't expect us to do that either. He'd expect us to rethink it and update it. Well, unfortunately, we've come to the end. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question for you, yes. Bart. Cheryl, well, what are you going to do for Nancourt? Uh, um, I mean, I constantly working on new projects. So I, I don't, you know, I don't. Uh, there's a wonderful project that I'm doing with uh, Lynn Nottage and Ricky Ian Gordon, um, turning uh, her extraordinary play *Intimate Apparel* into a sort of opera musical that we would do at Lincoln Center that we uh, co-commissioned with the Met. And we've had a wonderful success in the last couple of weeks doing a workshop of that. Uh, I'm hoping to do the film of Oslo, which was a play that I worked on uh, a year and a half ago, um, which was the, between the Palestinians and Israelis. Uh, a wonderful story that was uh, very important to me and which I think has a lot to tell us so there's many projects ahead. Again, turning history into drama. Well, we hope there yeah. are many more new projects. And Bart Scher, thank you so much thank for coming you. by. This has been wonderful. Great. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations. I'm Jim Zirin. Take care and all the best. Now we